conversation. Before we get started, I would like us to observe a moment of silence. We lost uh, one of our own uh, previous director, a, a legal giant, a very kind and generous man, Professor Christoph Haynes. Um, unfortunately, he passed on on Sunday. So I'm going to ask that we just observe a moment of silence for Professor Haynes. Thank you. Thank you. To begin, I'd like to mention just a few rules of engagement to make this conversation more productive and engaging. Should you have any questions, uh, please place them in the chat box. And once all our speakers have had their turn, they'll be allowed to engage with your questions. And now moving on to the content of this meeting. South Africa is, prepared, uh, is preparing for local government elections, which has been scheduled for the second half of the year. Um, several socio-political cleavages have influenced voter participation in South Africa and a demographic of interest when it comes to voter behavior is young people. The participation of young South Africans in elections is particularly important to note due to generational shifts that are inevitable in any society, but also particularly because voter behavior of young people affects voter turnout as a whole because of the demographic makeup of South Africa towards a more youthful population. In 2019, it was estimated that South Africa's youth made up one third of the population, which is set to increase. And, and of course, this is a prevailing trend in Africa where the youth is estimated to make about 60% of the continent's population. Now, the, the 2016 local government election saw a, a significant decline in voter turnout among young people, with the reports detailing that only 53% of the eligible youth registered to vote. And of those registered, uh, it is estimated that less than 50% actually voted. This also was the case in the 2019 general elections where young people are reported to have constituted a large population. And for this, we're looking at about 66% of the population who did not register to vote. And, and the turnout among registered young people was incredibly low. Records of the 2019 elections show that there was a decrease of 9% in voter registration of new voters between the ages of 18 and 19, and another decrease of 9% of those between the ages of 20 and 29. And this gives an indication that apathy is starting much earlier among young people. Um, several reasons have been given as an explanation for the low voter, or rather low youth participation in elections. Um, research suggests that Young South Africans are frustrated by formal political processes such as elections and do not believe um, in their ability to yield fruits. Issues such as um, you know, corruption, issues such as poor service delivery and, and the age debate in mainstream political participation has been set to influence youth voter participation in South Africa. Although South African youth tend to be apathetic towards elections, this does not reflect their apathy towards any other form of civic and political participation. And we see this clearly in the rise of vibrant political engagement in, or, or, uh, in South Africa university campuses through political parties. Um, social movements have risen as an alternative form of political engagement through various mediums, including protest and social media. We, we have seen social media, it has increasingly been used as a medium of activism, political engagement, and even uh, protest actions. We've also seen a rise of youth participation in protest actions against poor service delivery, corruption, human rights issues, and other key areas of concern 
for young people, as seen in the hashtag Feast Must Fall, um, hashtag Roads Must Fall movement, and similar movements born on university campuses in 2015 and 2016. And so the purpose of this webinar is to understand the trend towards declining youth participation, particularly at local government level, and what influences this trend, and also address the upcoming election to understand how young people intend to engage with these elections and what factors will, will influence the participation of young people in this case. And to help us um, uh, have this conversation, we've got three speakers. And at this point, I'm going to welcome Mr. Spamandla Fongo. Spamandla serves as a senior program officer at DDP um, in this portfolio. He's responsible for the implementation of projects that have an impact on the capacity of community-based organizations. Um, on interacting with local municipalities, as well as representing the organizations in various forums and conferences. And as at the Center for Human Rights, we've been privileged to have worked with Spamandla um, for a number of, a couple of months now in a few of our webinars and our conferences. Um, he's also an experienced community and process facilitator with a particular keen interest in public participation and election management. So Matla, you've got about 10 to 12 minutes uh, to, to make your presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonolo. Um, and welcome to everyone. I think you've got a really good turnout. Uh, considering that we are heading to the to the to the an interesting Easter weekend um, where people are not allowed to buy certain things um, in South Africa, at least. Um, we'd like to welcome also our colleagues from across the border um, who are interested in specifically in this conversation around apathy as it relates to young people. So, my name, as one of them said, is Pamanda Mshongo, um, and I work for an organization called the Democracy Development Program, and part of our work is gathering communities specifically around um, topics that relate to active citizenship. And a core element of our work has also been looking at what the effect is of the young people's lack of participation in these uh, democratic spaces, potentially for their voice. Um, so how, how much they can be heard in these spaces, but also to what extent they can start to actually um, advocate for their needs as young people in particular. I'm gonna start with a, with a sort of backtracking a bit in terms of what the system of democracy that we're operating in, um, the role of um, voter turnout in particular as a, as, a, as, a, as a link to what sort of electoral slash democratic legitimacy. Um, and then I'm going to explore some of the impact um, of the absence of young people, particularly um, at municipal level and looking at potentially are, is service delivery one of the driving trends, for instance, um, is public participation of the absence thereof um, a trend that we can start to think of when we look at um, what it is that impacts young people's participation or non-participation in those spaces. So if we were to take a step back somewhat, um, we would be aware, some of us in the space, that democracy is somewhat believed to be the best way of ruling a country. Um, and that the more citizens demand democracy, and then there, there are more citizens that seem to be demanding democracy around the world. Um, uh, of course, this is a common trend according to most researchers and politicians. One common form of rating countries' democratic status is looking at elections. So if all citizens are allowed to vote, if they can vote for whoever they want, and if the votes are counted properly and so on. Um, so those are some of the factors that we look at when we're thinking about the credibility of those elections in those democratic institutions. So if you look at it, elections and voting are crucial for a democracy. Since elections are the form of political participation that most citizens ever engage in. Um, and since the people's consent legitimizes the, the governing party's actions. Um, if we look at it, we also have the United Nations, which has deemed it an important enough to include the right to vote um, under the list of uh, human rights, um, of the human rights, Article 21 of human rights. Rather. So when we look at turnout or voter turnout in an election, we think of it as an important measure for political participation. The legitimacy of the government and generally how well the democracy functions. Low turnout um, is set to signal uh, that something is wrong in our society and in developed uh, democracies. Low turnout would be less, uh, would, would, would be, for instance, uh, if less than 70% of the eligible population 
um, quite problematic. Um, but do citizens really care about voting and turnout? Interestingly enough, um, turnout has declined worldwide and young people are amongst those who vote the least. Um, research suggests that young people have found other ways to express their political views. And as you would have heard from Obonolo, um, that this participation necessarily is not necessarily in, in the, the defined institutional way that we've, that we've sort of allocated uh, our democratic institutions to function under. Um, partially, of course, it's the idea that they feel alienated from the politics. And in some respects, the media scandal of the politics um, of our country and of our continent makes them cynical, while others believe that they are not interested, that they are cynical about the system or how much they vote will change in a bit. So this sort of exploration is, interested, is interesting from both a future perspective, so how the government will justify its actions if turnout is low, and from a present perspective about how government is viewed by citizens today. Um, so there's going to be a bit of a comparison and contrast with other countries around the world as far as voter turnout is concerned. Um, if you look at the US, for instance, turnout is already quite a problem where their turnout is far below, for instance, the European average. There have actually been debates about whether the candidates are legitimate or not, since fewer than 50% of the electorate votes in some elections. Um, there have been some conclusions reached that perhaps some factors such as the registration processes, the election system, um, as well as the idea of the electoral college and the two-party system might be inhibiting um, to that, to, to that uh, voter turnout and that people feel alienated from that system um, or that, for instance, other candidates um, or the candidates and thus won't vote, um, rather. Others have concluded that um, legitimacy uh, or importance of voting in general isn't something that citizens particularly care about. Um, you know that, for instance, that ideas are crucial um, in, in voting since they form an individual's reasoning about voting and possibly the behavior as well, since they are, uh, likely to, these are two uh, closely linked together. Moreover, research shows that young people have not necessarily uh, developed a political identity um, that says they do not necessarily know that after some elections are suggested if they have a positive view or negative view of the political system as well as of the political parties um, that are involved in those elections. So there's been a lot of work that's trying to actually understand what the perspective of young people in relation to elections and systems that govern ele elections um, ought to be. From a municipal level, we've seen that the trend is um, largely that it's not the same type of turnout that we see with our national and provincial elections. The trend at local government election is that we've seen um, that there's generally a lower voter turnout in, 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 in any case. But the significance here for us in our discussion today is that even at local government elections, the, the perspective of young people particularly seems to be um, poorly considered except in instances when political parties have the ability to use young people to cannibalize the rest of the community towards voting for that particular political party. So it's important to look at the, the case of the, the multi-party system in our country and how it influences um, the ways in which uh, young people particularly vote. In South Africa, we do have a trend um, uh, of the dominant, of a, a single party dominance within the African National Congress. But what's interesting from a, a, a local government perspective is that we've seen at least one quarter of all municipalities has been governed by an opposition party at one point in time. What that then says is that there is some um, competitiveness that's happening, particularly at local government level, to the extent that um, local government, or rather municipalities themselves, have had the change in leadership, um, which has been more significantly different than our national and provincial election. So when we look at the, the state um, of local government and what influences people to sort of shift around, um, they vote in that respect. We also have to look at um, the idea of service delivery because at, at the core of it, municipalities um, are primarily responsible for engaging in, de in the debates about what the bylaws of that particular area ought to be. Um, and then, of course, what the nature of service delivery ought to be and the, the, the sort of priorities that have to be enlisted for, that, for, for those particular wards and communities. Um, in our instance, um, and the work of the Democracy Development Program, we found that um, whilst 
service delivery is an important indicator for whether a political party stays or not, it doesn't necessarily translate to the same effect if, for instance, if positive service delivery occurs in the community. So uh, 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 most research that we found is that um, whilst service delivery uh, uh, protests are significant for people raising their voice and, be, and seeming discouraged, there isn't a trend of uh, rewarding um, uh, positive service delivery. So for instance, um, as particularly in, least of, in, in, in the case of the incumbent political party, voting trends illustrate that even when positive service delivery exists in that space, it doesn't mean that there's going to be an increased participation in that election itself um, or in any future election. However, the trend also dictates that um, when you have negative service delivery, so when there's poor service delivery in communities, the trend of actually um, uh, having uh, service delivery protests and other non-institutional forms of expressing disgruntledness, um, that, that rate actually increases as opposed to actually influencing the ability of people to come into the space and, and, and themselves cast their vote. So when we talk about young people being the, the, the basis for sometimes uh, political parties cannibalizing um, communities, um, we look at the, the, the ways in which our political parties are formed. Um, and we think that the ways in which currently political parties uh, seem to treat young people issues um, or the issues that are concerned primarily with young people at the periphery. Um, when I talk about the periphery, it's the formation of these uh, subgroups within political parties, the youth wings and all of those sorts of things. For as long as the politics of young people is not at the core of the party political mandate of those political parties, we think that there's not going to be a real cannibalization to the poll as opposed to just other, other campaigning methodologies that I utilize. Um, we see that in the dominant political parties that have the, the resources to be able to, 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 to do the work actually of, um, of, 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 of campaigning, um, quite a lot of the uh, campaigning primarily towards young people is at surface level. There isn't a real depth uh, in engaging um, the, the core of young people's needs and desires. So for instance, you have young people being at the forefront what the people assume appeals to young people being utilized as part of campaigning tools, for instance, the extravagance, um, the type of cars and all of those sort of weird stuff that people use when they're campaigning. But what, what, what's more important for young people is two things. Firstly, representation, but further, um, policy implementation that favors young people. On representation, it's important to consider also that when young people uh, feel genuinely represented, they are more likely to cannibalize themselves towards turning up at the, the polls. For both the National Assembly as well as the uh, local government councils, it's been significant that um, um, young people themselves don't form a significant part of, of, of the candidates themselves who are up for election in those spaces. Um, even when they are forming part of, of, of that uh, representative pool, many young people still question the the, the, the ability of those young people to actually translate um, that young person's candidacy into something meaningful within that party political system. So just by voting for young people in my local ward, for instance, does that have the ability to change the internal policy and functioning of that political party towards one that favors young people? And that quite largely has been a negative response. Um, we saw in 2019 um, that while the representation of young people grew both for the ruling party and generally for the national, um, within the National Assembly. Um, there hasn't been a real sense of actually driving um, and pushing towards a, 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 a young, a youth-centered National Assembly. Um, we've seen the postponement, for instance, um, or at least some issues that, that came about with the appointment of the NYDA board to the extent that it had to be restarted. And at the moment, it's, it's currently being rejigged for the purposes of ensuring that the people that are represented in that space um, actually have the ability to canvass on behalf of young people. Institutions such as the NYDA um, and other institutions that are meant to represent young people seem to be also at the periphery of our political discussion. Um, when you look at the fact that, for instance, um, in cabinet, young people are lumped together with a whole other uh, cohort of, of, of disadvantaged and, 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 and sort of sidelined communities, 
Um, there isn't a specific youth ministry, for instance. That's, that's something that's considered to be quite problematic. If you look at the, the representation when it comes to uh, who is in the cabinet, who is in the National Assembly, who's leading our provincial structures um, for government, there's still quite a, a significant m amount of work that ought to be done. So for us, those are some of the things that have driven young people away from the polls, um, and they've started to create alternative spaces for their own participation. These alternative spaces um, are important in creating um, an, uh, an, uh, a space where young people's voices can be heard. But what is important, also important for us as GDP, as well as the center, for instance, is that it, 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 we, need to, we need a way to funnel these, these energy, this energy. We need a way to funnel these thoughts, these ambitions into real policy shifts, right? Uh, and how do we do that? Um, part of what we, we could be doing, for instance, is um, enlisting the assistance of, um, of, of, of National Assembly to ensure um, that firstly, when uh, uh, committees are set up, that there are committees that are looking specifically at the role of young people in, in determining what policy direction the government should be going in. Um, and for as long as our population is going to be significantly young, um, but also significantly underrepresented both by the leadership, but also by the political policy, uh, by, by, by the policies that are in place, we're going to have a problem of actually our, our own democratic legitimacy, because it means that um, people are not turning up to the polls. It means that they don't buy into the system. And any reform that's currently happening also needs to be informed um, by the fact that whatever system ends up coming into the space um, actually speaks to the young people. Of course, we are somewhat encouraged by the decision from the New Nation Movement um, in the Constitutional Court last year that speaks about um, independent candidates. But what is that also a trend in relation to independent candidates at council level or at municipal level is that um, independent candidates are sidelined uh, politically because they don't have a sufficient mass. Um, within councils to actually enact decisions that are aligned, so they end up being co-opted by existing political parties or party political structures. That's something that we need to be wary of insofar as ensuring that um, these independent candidates that make it into these spaces are actually doing the work um, that, that, that they intended to in the beginning. But further, there is a resource divide when it comes to the role of independent candidates in our electoral system. Um, that the ability for one person, for instance, to campaign meaningfully um, sometimes means that they have to do things that are not necessarily within their value metric. Um, and so how do we ensure that the sort of the value metric uh, aligns with what we want to see in so far as independent candidates is concerned? So um, uh, information, so democratic legitimacy um, has a direct link towards um, voter turnout. Um, if, for instance, the continent's representation of young people is so significant that it forms more than uh, 40 to 50 percent of our, of, our, of our population, then it means that we need to start shifting those dynamics in a way that's meaningful. In terms of legitimacy, we also need to speak about representation. Representation, not just for the sake of representation, but for the purposes of actually shifting policy and shifting the type of, 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 of leadership that we have. A focus on, on young people-centered parliaments, a focus on young-centered policies um, is one way we need to start thinking about this. Thinking about apathy um, uh, sometimes has the ability to actually limit um, our consciousness about the young people's feelings and how immersed they are in the political system. When we are aware that they are participating in alternative spaces, we need to think about how do we direct their participation into a way that actually shifts um, the, the institutions that we form a part of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Spamandra. Um, I just want to come in there and, and I have a question for you. Um, part of what you spoke about is around representation. And I think we can agree that the conversation around representation goes along the way with uh, public participation, which is a, a constitutional value um, and underlines several constitutional principles like promoting active and representative or representation towards enabling young people in particular to influence um, decisions that affect their lives meaningfully. And, and, and when we think about public participation um, as one of the essential principles of democracy, uh, it must mean something. It must mean something to young people. Um, this and, and the idea around public participation for me, particularly within the context of young people and, and in a democratic state is that 
it, it must provide a space for, for, for young people to, to claim the state, if you may. In this case, we're talking about um, local municipalities uh, to claim the city, young people to claim the city, to claim the state and, and to influence decision making processes that, that influence service delivery priorities and, and policy formation. Um, and so a question here is that uh, particularly I know, and I'm asking you this question because I know that one of the things that uh, DDP does and you in particular have an interest in, in civic education. I'm wondering if there, there's sufficient civic education and, and what can be done to increase the reach of civic education, especially considering uh, COVID-19 climate. Um, we're going to be having elections in the last part of this year. Um, so is there su uh, um, sufficient civic education to young people? And I'm not only talking about, because oftentimes we have these conversations with us young people who, who are in the city center, who are the elites. Um, are we, as civil society organizations, are we doing enough to ensure that uh, the civic and, uh, education to other members of, of, of the community and, and what can be done by, as a way for civic education to increase uh, the understanding of uh, the role and the importance of, of local government to ensure that young people are voting? Thank you, thank you for that question, Manolo. Um, so at the moment, I'm actually at a, an engagement in Pochepton. Um, for child and youth care workers. And, and we, we, we're doing some engagement around civic education here as well, around capacitating them that in their work as child and youth care workers, they are conscious of uh, civic education and, and sort of active citizenship as core to their process. That when you are equipping people with any form of education, that it, it must also manifest in how the, the lived reality insofar as the political and, 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 and electoral landscape has the ability to shift in favor of, of their sort of constituency as well. So I think civic education is a very important tool. I think it's significantly underutilized um, um, both for the IEC. I understand that there are issues uh, for, for the IEC in particular, the idea that election on election, we've seen the IEC um, having a decreased budget um, for, the, for their work to operate. If you recall in 2019, they were only able to even convene only one voter registration drive ahead of the national and provincial election, um, as opposed to two or three that we, we would have seen in previous elections. So the type of um, maladministration, um, type of economic strife that the country is under also directly impacts the ability of these institutions to do the work that's necessary as far as civic education is concerned. Um, so from an, from an IEC perspective, I would think that there's still a lot of work to be done in that, in that instance. But of course, the IEC doesn't do its work in isolation. And when we, when we speak of civil society, then it's about how do we collaborate with, with institutions like the IEC in order to work. The, the, the significant part of it is that the, unfortunately, the ways in which public participation for spaces have been formed have been done to the, to the exclusion of what's considered to be the young person in our, in our, in our, in our country. Um, the, um, the ways in which, for instance, the municipality will put out information about um, a public engagement is not necessarily the same, um, will receive the same between di different demographics. And I think there's some questioning that we've had in the past about whether that's intentional or whether that's a byproduct of like um, uh, in poor capacity from the municipality standpoint. When we talk about whether it's intentional, we think about the fact that um, we might think about sort of uh, how excited we are as a country in South Africa, for instance, when we hear all of these political and media scandals about polit politicians and maladministration and all of this stuff. But is there space for real, genuine dissent to happen in our political spectrum? Um, largely um, at local government level, there isn't that real space um, for, 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 for dissent, particularly when you look at the fact that um, in, in, in many spaces, when it comes to the contestation for, for counselorship, for ward counselors, um, there's that, that contestation ends up being violent in some respects. Um, you would be aware that KZN is a province that has a history of, 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 of political violence motivated by the the thirst for um, um, uh, wanting to be a part of council, wanting to be a part of a, part of a, a patronage system that links you to the institutions of power within the municipality and so forth. We have um, currently 
um, a number of, of councillors and former councillors that are having to face the court because of the, the sort of patronage that's been created at local government level. So there isn't a real space for dissent for, in public participation spaces. If there's no real space for dissent, we find that young people generally divorce from that, themselves from that space because they feel, what's the point of participating if my participation is just a tick box exercise? If my being invited into that space is just to say that we've covered a specific demographic, but my uh, ambitions are not uh, translated into real genuine change in favor of the things that I'm asking for. So, um, so it's important then for us as a civil society um, to offer those spaces in a way that, 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 that's able to translate those things into genuine things. And we must be careful also of over-promising because we know how difficult the, 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 the bureaucracy is in the space of advocacy and lobbying. We know how uh, long it takes for the wheel to turn um, when we need to try and, 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 and sort of advocate for political will, because at the core of it, most development, most participation, most participatory spaces um, don't move because there isn't a real will to move because um, everything is fine from the eyes of the people who are currently running the system. If they are benefiting, if their passionate system is benefiting in one way or the other. Um, so if they don't see a need, they're not going to shift, even if there's a, there's a, a collective of young people that are that's already shifting the, the, at, at the bottom. Of course, what we're conscious of is the thing that, for instance, your, your other panelists will be speaking about, that there are young people who are actively pushing for a real shift um, in the country. And if that shift doesn't meet the political will at the right space, it means that there's a potential for, 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 for real danger overflowing onto our streets and into our communities that um, our institutions are not necessarily conscious of um, and, and, and are not necessarily engaging uh, genuinely in, in, in advancing the needs of young people. Thank you, Skamata. I think at the heart of it, um, we must constantly remember that the right to, to political participation shouldn't only be a procedural right, but um, a substantive right. And so, uh, as a collective, we, we need to figure out creative ways to assist us um, with, with practical steps uh, towards achieving a, a democracy roadmap where, where we, we, are just, we are saying to the states, um, don't just tick the box and say there was consultation with young people, there was participation. Um, it, 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 must be, it must be a substantive right and not, and not just a, a procedural right. Thank you for, for your brilliant presentation. I'm now going to move to uh, Ms. Busisiwe Siabe. Um, excuse me, Ms. Busisiwe is a, a powerhouse whose um, activism knows no bounds for, from giving masterclasses on black radical feminism and decolonization to conducting research for Houghton Provincial Legislature uh, to serving as an on-screen analyst to a number of television and radio stations in South Africa, a national Fees Must Fall student. So if you follow the Fees Must Fall movement, surely you should know, know Busisiwe. And so Busisiwe, thank you so much. I know how busy you are. Thank you for availing yourself to come have this conversation with us. This conversation with us. And Busisiwe will largely look at uh, uh, where young South Africans are and how they are feeling and how they are struggling with the state and how they are struggling with this new democratic government that, that we have. Um, and also explore with us some of the creative ways and alternative ways uh, where young people can, can, can identify um, these different spaces and, 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 and areas where they could engage uh, politically, especially using social movements as, as one of the the avenues to explore in participating in, in politics because we see that a lot of young South Africans are struggling with mainstream politics, are struggling with, with government. But like I mentioned earlier that though there's, there's, there's voter apathy, it doesn't necessarily mean that young South Africans are folding their hands. They're actively looking for, for creative ways to engage. And so Busisiwe will spend the next 10 to 12 minutes having this conversation with us. Um, over to you, Busisiwe. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, so, I mean, this topic is a very interesting one and it's one that I love engaging on. Um, I think because of the fact that, you know, youthful participation in politics and in voting is such a vital and important aspect of our democracy, um, I thought it very difficult to, you know, give you guys a presentation that would be succinct, that would be able to, 
present a lot of what the challenges I have um, noted are, um, while also addressing a lot of, you know, the current climate um, situations that we're currently faced with. So I'm hoping that the presentation is up. I'd like to believe that it's up. Um, and that you know you can see it as I can. But what I'd like to speak to first and foremost is I'd like to speak about like the drivers of political disillusionment among the youth. And my previous speaker did allude to some of them. Um, I'd just like to add that you know when we look at a, a poll that was conducted by the Institute of South African Studies through concentration of students from tertiary institutions, it found that youth apathy reflects the disillusionment with the current political landscape. So unemployment, corruption, self-enrichment, poor infrastructure, and poor education stood out with corruption standing out as a major disincentive to voting. Right? So when you look at the issue around poor education and you look at the issue around corruption, which is a very big issue in South Africa, on the continent and across the world as well, you get to understand why young people feel as though voting becomes a redundant exercise that they don't necessarily need to engage in because of the fact that everything momentarily remains the same even after voting, right? So this disillusionment has meant that patterns of political behavior among young people in more especially local elections are turning their backs on democratic institutions and withdrawing from the formal political process. This is seen in how the current youth generation is often as apathetic um, or even as anti-political with neither aptitude nor inclination for participating in any form of collective social endeavor and with no sense of civic responsibility, right? So an example of this, um, we can look at England in 2002, for instance, the driving force underpinning the introduction of citizenship classes in schools in England was an acknowledgement of an apparent concern with what was considered as a growing democratic deficit and increasing political apathy among young people. So when it comes to young people not voting, um, this is not only happening in third world countries on the African continent, but this is happening in first world countries, this is happening in developed nations um, across the world. And those developed nations have developed some strategies and mechanisms to ensure and to force young people to participate in their own democracies. Right? Um, and when we look at apathy, apathy was long thought to be the cause of low voter turnout among young South Africans. New research by the Institute of um, Security Studies, however, reveals that this apathy is actually disillusionment um, with the current political landscape. So youth apathy as a phrase doesn't tell us very much. Right? So in 2016, for an example, only 34% of young people under 30 who were eligible to vote participated. That number stood at 16% in 2019 and is projected to be even lower this year in the 2020 local government elections. This alludes to the fact that there may not be a fundamental understanding um, of democratic forms of governance or processes. And when we speak about democratic forms of governance or processes, and we speak about democracy, I think it's very important for us to be able to explain what we mean, right? So democracy is about achieving a greater balance in society so that there is greater equality for all. And this is what I believe young people struggle with. I believe young people struggle with the concept of achieving a greater balance in society in order to you know, have better and greater equality. Because when you look at the current political landscape, when you look at the socioeconomic conditions that we are subjected to as um, young people in this country, you get to understand that we might not necessarily need equality, but more equity um, when it comes to democratic processes, when it comes to socioeconomic development, and also when it comes to participating in politics in general, right? So, when I conducted a study when I was doing One Day Leader, um, and I conducted a study when I asked young people about the concept of politics, young people's responses were that it is a process that is mystifying and difficult to engage with. 
it is also characterized as remote from their immediate experiences and considered to be a world that is inhibited by an unrepresentative and self-centered political elite. Right? It has become a norm for young people or the youth to believe that they cannot um, get any tangible change from participating in elections or voting. But what is imperative to consider and understand is that voting as a form of democratic accountability, which is one of the pillars of any democratic system, cannot fully happen without certain degrees of disillusionment. So if we're going to be looking at young people's participation in voting and them engaging in democratic forms of accountability, certain degrees of disillusionment are necessary. In fact, they are very fundamental in ensuring that democratic processes are able to thrive and that young people can participate in meaningful, tangible ways, right? So although young people seem to find the world of politics as broadly remote and unappealing, indeed the majority appear to have a deep aversion of many aspects of it. They do nonetheless claim an interest in it, right? In this respect, they might be characterized as engaged skeptics, as people who are alienated from politics, but who are neither apolitical nor apathetic. Right. So today's generation of 18 year olds, my 2000, as we'd like to call them, um, seem to lack external um, efficacy and are doubtful about their abilities to gain access and influence over the political process. So though many of the youth feel elections provide a mechanism through which to link professional politicians and citizens, it is also the case that young people feel strongly that the actual value of elections is somewhat limited. Although acknowledged that elections are important, a majority consider that although elections allow voters to express their opinion, they don't really change anything. And a sizable minority consider elections to be a big waste of time and money. Now, an example I would put, right, with regards to our relationship as young people, at, yeah, young people, I'm young. <laughs> Sorry, I tend to forget sometimes that Listen, um, our relationship as young people with voting and with politics and the political arena is a very abusive relationship, right? So when you think about a, an abusive relationship, it doesn't necessarily have to be a heterosexual abusive relationship. It can be one between a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, and a man and a man. But necessarily the nature of any abusive relationship is not necessarily a give and take. It is a constant loop of self-sacrifice. And I believe that young people in not only South Africa, but across the world feel as though they are constantly having to self-sacrifice themselves in order for the democratic processes to unfold and to yield tangible results. And what I mean by self-sacrifice is that they have to give up to a large extent um, the visions the objectives, the goals that they have for this country, for themselves, for their immediate families, and for what they find serves their self-interest for the betterment of society as a whole. So you're basically asking individuals like myself to disregard our self-interest, to disregard everything that makes us individuals and everything that we celebrate as individuals for the betterment and for a vision that is supported by a collective, a vision that we may not see manifest in our lifetime or a vision in our political climate at the moment that might not come to realization because of corruption, self-enrichment, unemployment, poor infrastructure, and most importantly, poor education, right? So when we speak about disillusionment among youth, over several decades, the tectonic plates that shape this and sustain democratic participation have shifted. The changes have been economical, social, cultural, and political in nature and are interlinked. What this means is that there are many young people who are not politically engaged or active. And these young people tend to come from poorer backgrounds and to not go on to higher education or to leave school with few, if any, qualifications, right? So this large segment of youth po um, population tends to be termed the disillusioned and the disengaged, as I have mentioned. Um, in my presentation, I've just put a bit of a slide to show how over the decades, 
um, you know, the sustainability of democratic participation has shifted from youth partic uh, political participation to how it is influenced by economic and social change, along with um, political change as well. But I think what we need to be um, focusing on and what we need to engage on extensively is on how um, have youth led social movements as alternative methods of political engagement affected how the youth engage with mainstream politics. And this is where I come in. This is where movements like the Fees Must Fall movement come in. This is where the um, you know, Roads Must Fall movement comes in. Um, because of the fact that young people's apparent willingness to take part in more unorthodox methods of mass social and political action, along with their abs, um, you know, their abstainance um, and abstention rates at recent elections, this raises important questions to policymakers and the general public regarding what they consider to be a persisting decoupling of young people from the formal political process. Right? So what I mean by this is that young people from predominantly middle-class households are significantly less skeptical of the value of elections than are their working class counterparts. Right? Furthermore, remaining in full-time education appears to temper any doubts harbored about the electoral process. And this is why our um, new civic education becomes important, but more broadly, education as a fundamental basic human right and necessity becomes important because education allows people to remove and to address the doubts that they harbor about electoral processes. Right? So a combination of economic stagnation high levels of educational attainment and rapid social change have resulted in a historically distinct cocktail of political engagement and resentment and the emergence of a large young group of cosmopolitan left citizens, right? So in, when you look at the Fees Must Fall movement, you find that to a large extent, what we were doing as a student body, as a movement that was trying and is still trying to attain free quality decolonized education is we were trying to, as young people, exercise our cosmopolitan left citizenship, right? And this is something that I would definitely love to expand more on, on what I mean by cosmopolitan left citizenship, but unfortunately we don't have the time. Uh, I would need to, you know, lecture at UP. Um, to be able to do that. But more than anything, I think when we look at how studies have shown that young people's politics is defined by both material interests, which become more pressing in the aftermath of, for an example, the 2008 financial crisis that affected the entire world, but also by an outward looking cosmopolitan and acceptance of cultural diversity. So young cosmopolitan left individuals like myself are likely to hold university degrees to be full time um, to be in full time education, female, and live in an urban environment and understand the necessity and the need to participate in voting. Now this sets me apart from the majority of um, citizens, not only in South Africa but on the African continent, and this is because of the fact that one our literacy rates across the continent and across the world are appalling, especially amongst black um, um, indigenous people or black people of African descent, right? So literacy rates and the fact that there's high dropout rates, not only in universities of higher education, but also in primary education, gives you an understanding that um, you know, most of the people in our society, most of young people around us do not necessarily understand the benefits, not necessarily understand um, the objective and the need to participate in voting because of the fact that they do not have the educational background to be able to capacitate the need to engage in that kind of a democratic process. Now, when you speak about the educational capacity, I'm not speaking about whether you can quote, um, you know, literature from 
theorists in sociology or philosophy or any other discipline, but having the basic ability to read and write, to understand and to be able to articulate yourself is a form of education. It's informal education, actually, that does not necess necessitate you being um, formally qualified using a degree, right? But the fact that our literacy rates are so low in this country gives us an idea of the kind of response that we can expect when it comes to voting, um, especially amongst young people, right? So one reason for optimism regarding youth participation is that young people continue to engage in politics broadly understood, despite their um, relative lack of enthusiasm for politicians and political parties. This suggests that the problem is less to do with a general lack of political engagement and more to do with the disconnection between young people and the political system. So the changing social, economic and political conditions for engagement include the increasing prominence of identity politics, austerity and public spending since the start of the 2008 global financial crisis and the role of the new media in facilitating political engagement also play a very big role in how young people engage in voting and the voting process and take up their responsibility in engaging with the democratic process of voting, right? So political action is increasingly centered around everyday issues that challenge citizens' identity and can um, bubble up with great speed and intensity. Political location remains important for young people's politics in fostering a sense of identity, in offering spaces to practice democratic skills, and in providing symbolic locations such as city squares and university campuses for political action. And this is where we're seeing a lot of youth participation taking place, right? We're seeing young people fostering a sense of identity using unorthodox methods of mass social and political action. So young people are preferring to use unorthodox methods of social and political action, as opposed to putting an X on a box and putting it on a paper and in a ballot, right? So they're trying to find and foster a sense of identity using unorthodox methods. And we need to be able to engage why this is important for young people and why young people have moved away from the traditional form of you know, changing the democratic process and engaging in democracy to adopting more unorthodox methods, right? What is certain is that young people's perceptions of politics and repertoires of engagement have changed, right? So political participation is increasingly viewed through the lens of individual action frameworks, whereby formal organizations are losing their grip on individuals and group ties are being replaced by large scale fluid social networks. And this is what movements like the Fismas Forum movement are. They are large scale fluid social networks. And they're important because we should also remember that an individual's position and progress in society is not only determined by their cognitive and social skills, though they do play an important role, but they are economic, class, gender, and ethnicity of factors that can affect whether a young person is invited to a job interview um, means that young people are going to be able to take their political and democratic process more personally than we have seen in the past, right? So young people are not only satisfied anymore with putting an X in a box and putting it on a piece of paper and voting. They want to do more, right? And they want to do more because of the fact that they understand that economic class, gender, and ethnicity are factors that affect um, their participation and how the world receives and engages with them. So after the onset of you know, financial crises, like the one we're currently faced with in the COVID-19 pandemic, we experienced an um, initial surge in youth participation in non-electoral forms of politics. And this is why you're seeing a lot of service delivery protests. This is why you're seeing campaigns like the Me Too campaign, Black Lives Matter, Fees Must Fall, finding so much predominance because young people are motivated by frustration and anger with the politicians and public policy 
that is facilitated by recent advances in communication technologies, right? So we also need to take into cognizance that technology and the advancement in communication has played a major and big role in shifting the degree and the means in which young people engage in voting. And we need to understand that the internet and social media have enabled a dramatic speeding up mobilization by acting as a real-time filter for alternative politics, where only the most resonant ideas um, find expression. So in a, in a society, in a generation where you have you know, social media working hard to speed up political mobilization and a youth demographic that is motivated by frustration and anger, you're more likely going to find their expression of this frustration and anger and their ability to navigate through this new fourth industrial revolution being used in unorthodox methods of mass social and political action as opposed to them physically showing up to voting booths, right? So in one of the slides that um, I have, I've spoken about, you know, the aggregate rates of youth participation in, um, in petitions, boycotts and demonstrations. Um, so, in, and, and the case study that I, I use the United States, I use the UK and six other Netherlands and Sweden in order to be able to actively correlate and to show why young people would rather join boycotts, would rather participate in signing petitions than to participate in actual voting um, when it comes to you know, um, putting an X on a ballot box, right? So voting in national elections or participation in demonstrations is what young people today are most likely to want to engage in their and the pacifying, and I say that very deliberately, the pacifying um, you know, instrument of going to voting stations and voting. Right? So when we look at Fees Must Fall and strategies for youth participation, an interesting question we should consider is whether we want effectiveness or participation when it comes to um, youth and elections. Right? So one of the things, and one of the case studies that I would encourage everyone to look at is how Belgium, Yes, I'm wrapping up, I know, yes, I speak yes. a lot. Yes, I've literally just one more minute. Um, so one of the case studies I'd like everyone to look at that I cannot delve deeper into is um, how Belgium has made it compulsory for young people to vote in um, you know, democratic processes and in their country. And I think that this is something that is very important. This is something that is a strategy that, you know, South African governments, governments across the world might need to look at in order to get youth participation. I believe that the current constitutional court ruling, um, you know, that came out last year um, is very important because it has the ability to allow independent candidates to stand in national and provincial elections um, in offering a wide choice that, you know, could entice apathetic eligible voters into the process and attract others away from established parties. So young people are not voting because we don't believe that political parties are invested or interested in upholding what we believe as a collective of young people should be the agenda of the day, but rather they are motivated by their own self-interest, corruption, and other things. And I believe when young people think about voting, they think about the fact that since the dawn of democracy in South Africa, we have not seen any tangible changes, um, you know, because for an example, the ANC will campaign about free education in 1994, which is something that is enshrined in the constitution and the freedom charter. But in 2021, we have students across institutions of higher learning protesting for free education. So voting then becomes a redundant exercise. So we need to start thinking about whether we want effectiveness or participation when it comes to elections, because we can't have both. We can have either or unless we change the political and the democratic system process and landscape in South Africa. I will have to leave it there, beautiful people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pusisiwe. I'm going to ask you two questions, but please don't answer them now.
Um, so one, you, you spoke about um, youth uh, participation, having you linked it to, you know, economic and, and educational backgrounds where uh, those from poorer backgrounds who have lower levels of education uh, part participate in less than uh, their middle class and working class counterparts. And I think in the South African context, it may be worthwhile to, to pay particular attention um, to the class question. Um, South Africa is characterized by a dichotomy between, between classes, the rich and the poor, uh, resulting in the two economies and two ideologies. And so in light of this, it's essential then to consider, consider mechanisms that are inclusive of all, of all classes, mechanisms that, that are inclusive and pay attention to intersectionality of identities that you have highlighted, class, race, gender, age, and so forth. So, so just a question to say, um, what, will then, what will then it look like for us in, in, in most practical terms um, to consider mechanisms that, 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 that pays attention to, to the two economies and, and the two ideologies that we see in South Africa. And secondly, um, given the rise of, of police brutality in the world and on the continent, you think about NSARS movement in, in Nigeria, but we see a lot of police brutality here in South Africa towards protesters, particularly young people. Um, you know what happened at West University a few weeks ago. Um, so does this have a, a chilling effect on alternative participations such as uh, protest actions? And how do you imagine the role of the state uh, transforming in this area and the need to, to balance the crowd um, and to control, to balance crowd control, particularly when we consider freedom of association and, and freedom of expression as provided in the constitution. So, so, so some ways in which the state can, 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 can figure out in, in, in when, when they are protest and how they balance crowd control without having, without having to be violent, because that's what we, we, we've been seeing with a lot of protests in, in South Africa. But also we are not an exception, like I said, we, we saw this in Zimbabwe last year, we saw it in, in Nigeria, as well last year. So, so I know that South Africa has been often accused of a sense of exceptionalism and, and also considering that uh, we've got um, a whole lot of other people from other parts of the continent. So police brutality is not just a case of South Africa. It is a case um, of, of the entire continent and again um, in the world. So, so, so maybe think about this and you can answer this later that how do you imagine the role of the state transforming in this area and the need to balance crowd control versus freedom of association and, and freedom of expression. Um, so thank you so much for, for, that, for that presentation. Before I hand over to, 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 to Mr. Tawan Onkanga, I'm going to give five minutes to uh, Ms. Caroline Litsualo. Uh, Caroline is a, a UP LLB graduate um, and she's currently a, a candidate, an LLM candidate in constitutional law and philosophy at the University of the Free State. And we specifically invited Caroline to, to just respond to some of the things that Busiswe has said, because Caroline was a um, part of the Fees Must Fall movement at the University of Pretoria when she was a student. And, and, and it's important to hear these stories. Sometimes we have these philosophical and abstract conversations and, and, and we forget um, human beings that are part of, of these movements. So I thought it would be, it's important to have Caroline in the room as a, as a former student activist to share her story and to make just three, five minutes reflection um, on what and what Pusisu has, has, has presented on. Caroline, over to you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Bonolo and Mr. Uh, so I'll be quite brief in the sense that I have put my reflection in a way that it kind of agree with uh, Ubusisi and also putting on the issues of rights, where I rely usually uh, mainly on what uh, Karin van Mala has coined as the right to the, to the university. Uh, a phrase that has been famously coined by Harvey and Lafay, uh, particularly on when they speak to the right to the city, something that Winola has brought up, is that it's a situation where now that uh, the conversation that we should be having is seeing the university not only as only the right to educa education, 
but the right to access to the university itself. Ubusisi spoke about something regarding access and the commodification and the corporalization of the universities, and that's how they operate. And I would like to touch particularly on uh, the, the, the issue on uh, the 2000s that they feel that they cannot engage actively in, uh, the, in politics, mainstream politics or even university politics, because I think the deep uh, how the universities depoliticize social movements, like student social movements and politics in itself. So in a way that now we have been having a chat that the Fismal School Movement started in 2015, I came in as a first year in 2016, and we saw it come up again in 2021, which is now led by uh, AMA 2000, what we, we refer to them as. So we see that this is going to be a perpetual issue. The issue is not only, it's, it's an issue of CDS, but it's an also an issue of access. Access to what? Access to the university and access to urbanization. When that access is denied and is given to a few, and that few is a particular uh, kind of beneficiary. It, we, we see a problem where when, even when the university uh, produces graduates, they also don't have access or they don't have a right to the city that the university is in. And that becomes a particularly difficult chat that we are having is that FISMAS4 did not say, don't increase your fees, but we said we want free quality decolonized education. And that call and, and the meaning of, uh, and the meaning of FISMAS call is not lost. It's still being said in, in, a, in a span of, I think it's six years now. The question is, how do we keep the movement alive while also taking cognizance and the nuances of the political climates that we are currently in and the, the newer generation? Uh, for myself, I feel like this issue of uh, education and, and access to higher education started with the, the class of 1976, and it has been going on continuously. So I agree with Mr. Sewell in saying a chat needs to be had or, or with the youth as to where do we fit in, where do our politics fit in, and how can we incorporate that into mainstream politics, where we do not only take we do not only leave the politics inside the university, but we take them outside as we have a right to do so. So yes, uh, that is my two cents, and I'm looking forward to answer any engagements at the Q&A section. Thank you so much, Caroline. I appreciate mm. that. And I'm going to hand over to Mr. Tabo Nongenge. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, Tabo will spend time looking at how will the government's response to COVID-19 pandemic influence the youth's voter behavior in the upcoming elections, um, the upcoming local government elections, and also look at what strategies can be adopted to increase youth participation, again, in the upcoming local government elections. Um, Tabo is a trained, a trained architect and also worked as an architect for nearly a decade before migrating to data science. Um, out of a sheer passion to pioneer impactful solution at scale. Um, he now heads up Source Tech and is a co-founder and CEO of Source Tech. And, and Tabo, maybe for two minutes before you make your presentation, you can share with us what Source Tech is, because I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant app that, that, that works towards um, fixing the challenge that we have in this country of, of gender-based violence. So I'll give you just a minute, Tabo, to, to just briefly talk about the app that you have developed and its importance in, 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 in you know, responding to the gender-based violence uh, pandemic that we have at the moment and have had for many years in this country, um, and also speak to uh, the two questions that I've highlighted and government's response to, to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and its influence to voter, to youth voter behavior in the upcoming local government elections. Over Tabo. Thank you so much, uh, Nolo. We, we at SOS are really um, humbled to have been invited. We're fairly new, but our exposure as individuals has allowed us to at least have something of an opinion um, in, in this kind of space where, where we are being invited to. So, so briefly, as, as Bunal was um, reflecting on, essentially what we're doing at SOS is we're trying to find a way 
that to instigate um, the understanding that technology is actually really there to enhance um, and make life generally easier. Um, technology is not there to replace us. Computers are not capable of strategy, um, but we are here to collaborate and create the space where it's, pos it's possible for us to make these things possible. So essentially, just by, by, by way of, of swiftly introducing SOS, we're, we're, the first, we're the world's first crowdsourced um, security platform. Um, that means we use our people in terms of everyone in, around, in and around us, um, not anyone who's been employed by SOS, um, to, 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 to engage technology in a way that helps um, against gender-based violence. The app works in a way that is downloadable for free, um, and if you're an Android user, um, please feel free to start searching the, the, the Google Play Store. Um, it gives you an option between two profiles. One is free, one is a paid profile. Um, the paid profile basically allows you to be able to call help. Um, the free profile says, I would like to be part of a community of first responders so that I can find a way to create an intervention, um, respond as part of a team and, and find ways to curb gender-based violence. What you do see once an active citizen, sorry, once an active incident has, has begun, so if I press my alarm, everyone in my vicinity for over 500 meters receives the signal at the same time as private security companies who are currently integrating with the police. Um, what then they see is a screen saying, hey, here's my profile picture and my face, sorry, and my age and my name. Um, it gives you the location and my live location should I move. And then what it does is that it gives all the people who receive my signal the ability to read in terms of who's responded, um, how many have responded, where are they, are they police, are they regular citizens, are they private security companies. This gives us a way to engage um, technology in a way that is collaborative with authorities, number one, number two, collaborative with society in a way that is practical and pragmatic. Um, and so I'll stop there quickly with SOS, but, but the, the, the theme around pragmatism is really one I'd like to explore um, hopefully you, you'll see this as I speak. Um, if you don't, if you aren't able to see the presentation, please give me um, a shout in the comment section. But essentially, I'd like to really walk you through some thoughts um, that we were asked to reflect on, uh, just three questions, and I'll walk you through them. If I, if I take too long, please feel free to stop me, Bonalo. Um, but essentially, uh, the, the, the grand themes I'd like to cover today are really around the, the topic um, in, as, in as obviously in as far as youth um, apathy is, 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 is related. But the, the main one for me is really the questions that I was kind of drawn to and the last three on the list, but I'd like to kind of walk you through um, in this kind of format here with this presentation. So the government's response, for instance, to COVID-19 um, and how it might influence us as young people, and I say us because I'm only 33, um, we, we are really, um, I think, in a special moment in our lives and in our time as youth, because we've managed to exist in the age of giants and see the giants fall, um, not just politically, but even commercially. So Nokia, Motorola, um, and we've seen new giants rise. Um, and, so, and so what this question kind of inspired in me was, was really the, the fact that it's, it's very much, in my view, a throw forward question. And, what, and by that, I mean that it does assume a little bit that we are now no longer in a pandemic and maybe there might be a perspective or at least a retrospective view that we could take as the youth um, as to what the government's response is. I think what's exciting is we're watching the government's response. I think what's really interesting about the government's response is that it's incredibly transparent. We're being engaged, we've even tagged at family meetings. Um, and so I think there's been some sincere efforts on the part of the, the existing government to, to participate with us in a way that says, well, you know, as young people, as, as the general public, not only are, you interest, are we interested in your opinions, but we'd like your buy-in. And, and I think that's what has been quite encouraging for me in as far as um, the president's leadership during this time is that not only has he managed to get our buy-in by and large, um, for the most part during the lockdown, but even with our unhappy moments, he's been quite easily um, accessible to reflect on these things via Twitter. Um, we remember when Mamna Kolokhupom stood down um, the president opened his remarks, um, his, his address by saying he'd actually decided to start late simply because the giant was stepping down. And so, and so I'd like to continuously reflect on this theme of, of how we exist as a youth in a very special era in our time. And so, and so if I were to answer the question, it would be really in two, in two ways. It would be, I think if we were to reflect on it as a strategic 
um, or at least as, a, as one that is as, as a future throw forward. But while we're here, um, it's really a referendum on leadership. And I think much like we saw in the United States with the fact that they had an election mid pandemic um, and, and how that kind of reflected and affected how the, the, the public voted, um, the national rhetoric around what to do. I think that this question kind of, you know, because it presupposes that we're, we were able to have a retrospective view. I think it encourages us to it encourages us it encourages us, excuse me, to to explore themes around inclusion and action. Um, and I was quite inspired to when I was listening to the earlier speakers. Um, unfortunately, the bulk of us um, are no longer men in these spaces. Um, it's been a fairly inclusive uh, panel, and I'm really appreciative of that. I come from a family of only women. Um, and so essentially the themes around inclusion and action for me are really the important ones um, as, a, as a youth, as a South African youth. Um, briefly about myself, I come, from, I come from a rural area called Umtata. Um, my parents then later moved to another rural area called Harding in the south of KZN. So I'm an Eastern Cape KZN straddling person. Um, and essentially we have, as, as the South African underbelly, uh, have experienced the, the harsh reality about about government and, and inaction, um, about government and lack of inclusion in most instances. And so these are very strong themes for me. And I think that they're quite compelling if you think about um, on, the, on the inclusion side, the fact that rural and urban youth need to be involved um, and the government needs to participate on existing platforms. So if you were to imagine um, platforms like the Judicial Council, um, we have a contralesa structure that is entirely unengaged almost at a social media level. Um, even by ourselves as young people, but these are people who are quite a significant block in as far as rural life is concerned, right? So, so, so inclusion around things, for instance, we heard a lot about the government speaking with regard to rescuing businesses during the pandemic, right? We haven't seen that kind of um, response, even when the government is offering to give people a stipend simply because they are in a recession and we're in lockdown. So we managed to see all those things and the positive reflections about that were that we got a lot of buy-in because the government was said to be inclusive um, in these actions. And so while we may not necessarily be looking at, um, while we may not necessarily be looking at a, a specific angle in terms of we're trying to audit a specific um, action that the government is taking place, by and large, their efforts have really pointed to the fact that they're trying to include us. Um, but I think that the, the efforts are rather, rather shallow. So I would say that to challenge the government and, and require them to say, um, you know, the existing structures, the fact that we have people um, in the judicial leadership, the fact that we have people in local government who are part of, uh, you know, entire communities where it's not just an ANZ branch or a DA branch, but they can be the kind of social action that is, that is inclusive um, of what people are currently doing and enhance that where they are. And so, and so I think that a lot of that has to do with digital enablement, enablement through cheaper data rates. I would even say in certain areas because of low income, uh, low income and, and obviously the income gap, we should consider having entirely zero rated communication costs, right? I think that would be inclusive of a youth that is trying to re-enfranchise itself within the context of our democracy, right? And on the action side, I think it's really, really important to, to state because I'm coming from a tech company um, and our sincere obsession around solving um, for the problem of gender-based violence and safe communities, We've, we've got to kind of point to this glaring one where there are current existing frameworks like the anti-GBV budget um, that we all know about. I'm not sure what the actual figure is, but it was in the billions. We'd like, I think, as the youth to, to kind of be part of the process of, of either dissemination of the information or at least part of some kind of dashboard that allows us to co-monitor these things. And so it's, it's important because the inclusion and the action is really, I believe, what will get us to a place where the ballot box um, is no longer a place where we, we look at with disdain. Um, and really, like our previous speakers have pointed to, um, you know, a place where we really kind of want to, to act and point to from the, from the streets and protest in light of the fact that we feel there's a lack of justice at the ballot box for our cause. And so, and so deepening access, um, I believe, it, within the context of the COVID-19 response, we aren't in the, in the space where we now are able to sit with a printer or a laptop um, at, a, at, a, at a workstation. We are all working either from home or people have had to completely quit their jobs. And so deepening the kind of access as a really important action in as far as allowing people to do what we were pointing to, um, if you follow my cursor here on the inclusion side, where youth-led enterprise development, because we don't all want jobs. I believe that a lot of us have come to a place where we understand the economy 
to have migrated from one that is you know, going to be readily employing us because of our qualifications. But we're quite sincerely looking to engage in, in the gig economy. And I think that's important because what it does is that it allows us to self-actualize and self-autonomize. And so I'll move on to the very next question. Um, feel free to, to make interjections, B, um, if you feel any, any strongly about my responses. But I think that um, the questions for me that are interesting the most are the last two. So, so the youth's affinity towards other forms of political expression um, being an expression of, of apathy or, or depicting a changing world order. The, the expression that came earlier um, around finding other means of communication and participating um, was really quite, quite inspiring and, and, and kind of gave me the sense that I was thinking in the right direction here. Um, just in as far as I believe that the stance one would take, at least I would take in as far as answering this question is, the change in the world order is really what I believe it, it, it exemplifies or at least indicates. And by that, we mean that people uh, have always found a way to express themselves, you know, more, more politically through non-conventional means. We would know that the Soweto uprisings didn't take place on social media, um, but it took place on a kind of social media that existed at the time. And so the children in Soweto were quite effective in that, in that instance. We would know that the, that the Defiance campaign was, was a social media of sort in terms of how in terms of how information was disseminated, people couldn't send emails. An anecdote from one of my grandfathers who was an activist during that time, he says that there were actually two gentlemen who'd be tasked to run a distance from almost Alex in Johannesburg all the way to the city center. And one would carry a poster, one would carry some glue. And, and essentially they would run almost sprint between the north of Alex and Park Station and smear paint, or at least smear glue in this instance, and put the poster so that it can stick. Right, and by morning when people go to work, um, and he'd be laughing and so excited because he says they had to be incredibly fit gentlemen. Um, by morning, the way they would have communicated would have been effective because everyone who's going to work can now see these plaques that are all over the street. And the important thing there was that they got information out and it was able to allow them to mobilize. And so I think that the, the, the two sides that I've decided to kind of point to in, in with regard to answering my question, Sorry, the question is that the youth, youth agency and or, or rather organizing and public participation have, have for me always been key. As a former student activist myself, we were quite insistent um, while we were non-partisan. Um, if you'd like to look it up, we were part of the IFH in Kulu Free 8. Um, we took down our website, but Wikipedia has recorded us. We still have a little bit of information out there. And essentially the push there was a lot of technology, um, central kind of communication using social media, um, in, a, in a time where the EFF didn't actually exist. And so they, they sounded to be because the ANC had kicked out Malema um, and we weren't quite sure whether the DA was for us or not. We were, we were engaged in a, in a series of, of discussions across university borders between UCT and MMU or the current MU, Nelson Mandela University and Rhodes, uh, Vits included, uh, still in Wash, I think was one of our campuses. We essentially tried to create spaces where, where we would have quote unquote soapboxes because agency and, and protecting the independence of thought was quite important to the autonomy of our actions, right? So we're not a political party that is partisan. We were a group of young people who were non-partisan but wanted to do a lot of what was spoken about earlier around, around civic education. So, so, so that kind of pragmatism was really emblematic of not just a frustration, but the desire to express our agency to organize in a way that was original. Um, and I think that that was an example. And I, and I really appreciate the, the previous the speakers having shared about their experiences with, with Fismas 4. I had, unfortunately, I had, uh, it took place on the hills of my post-graduation um, at university. And so I was quite a witness to it while I was, was envious of what was taking place um, on campuses that I used to walk. And so part of public participation that, that I believe reflects a change in the world order is that governments are becoming much more apt in responding when they're required to, um, either by means of protest um, or by, by using television and social media. And so you found government spokespeople, for instance, increasingly younger, increasingly engaged in social media. And I think that the public participation that will be more meaningful isn't the, the one what I'm mentioning. I think more meaningful public participation is, and, and I think that the youth understand that the meaning of meaningful is, is that we are making use as people, as young people of non-traditional political organization means. And so, for instance, if you reflect how, reflect on how distributed Fismas 4 was, um, similarly to how distributed the Black Lives Matter movement was, right? So if, if you look at the examples I'm making on the second point under public participation, 
with Tiananmen Square in the 90s. I'm not sure if, if any of us would remember. I, I'm, I think I was four at the time, um, but I was, I was quite interested in it a few years ago when I was looking through some stuff internationally. You know, Tahir Square was quite similar. We were in university at the time when that took place with the Muslim Brotherhood um, using social media, uh, et cetera, and, and obviously non-traditional platforms um, have emerged since. Um, and I think Black Lives Matter is the most recent, uh, possibly the, the biggest global movement that we've seen in, towards this end. And I think that the interesting thing there is that we're seeing not just a public participation that is, that is, that is created around a cause that is not just clear, but is long overdue, but I think that the way in which people have organized the, the, the inability um, to pinpoint the headquarters um, of, of the think tanks, the inability for, for governments to, 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 to pinpoint the headquarters of the democracy, or at least the pro-democracy uprisings in, in, in Hong Kong. We've got an entire plethora of examples globally that insist that young people um, will always reinvent not just themselves, but ways of communicating. And that is always preceded by some kind of revolution, either in thought, policy, or, or like we saw uh, with the, with the the Black Lives Matter movement, a global kind of galvanizing of not just youth and black youth in particular, but female voices on the forefront, the ability for us to step aside from, from the thinkings that are traditional, even as male participants in the space has been quite indicative of, of what I believe to be progress in the space. And so lastly, I think the important thing about what I was trying to express earlier is that, you know, technology is not here to replace us. Um, you know, words like strategies where, where computers are completely unable um, to participate in, in that kind of thought uh, are what for me strengthens the case in as far as, uh, excuse me, in as far as, in as far as putting the government, at least putting technology central to, to other solutions or, or inciting a kind of culture. Um, but with us as the early adopters and by us, I mean youth, uh, We've got we've got the time and and the, and the brain power to spend on it. So so I believe a strategy for me, and I'm and I'm shooting here from from a few years of experience. Um, but quite simply put, we've got we've got no time for people who speak. Um, the youth are interested in action, um, and I think that the important thing around action is that the government must show up for young people. Um, and and I think that the important thing there is that. We've got the culture of engaging the government from the streets, but the reason why there's despondency at the ballot box is because the government has been seen in many instances not to show up for young people. And so I think that creating spaces, physical spaces, and I believe as a tech company, this is my job, um, to insist on, on, on the understanding of the role of technology in creating physical safety, all right? And the point there is to say, we cannot, as a society, think of any other basis as the bedrock for prosperity other than safety, physical safety, which gives you mental peace of mind. And so I think it's important to juxtapose those next to each other. Um, and I believe that in a country like ours, who's demonstrated in the past, the ability to collaborate, um, not just with each other, but with government um, on, on programs like Love Life, uh, on, on how we managed to, to take the statistics of HIV AIDS and bring them down, how that even has given us the ability to, pre, to, to be able to analyze the coronavirus well because our medical apparatus is, is world-class. And so I don't believe that it's something that's foreign to us to actually reach to a new standard. I think that the South African public understands quite clearly the potential that all of us possess. What's created the, the kind of despondency has really been what we've engaged, at least witnessed with the government and, and sometimes letting us down when it comes to the lack of service delivery as such. And so I believe that along with this, with what I'm pointing to at physical safety is enacting and making Ubuntu central to public life in, in ways that allow us to engage and contribute meaningfully. Um, engaging on youth led platforms, uh, it was alluded to earlier and I'm, and I'm gonna obviously harp on about technology, but I think that we need to speak more aptly or at least more, more loudly around the more meaningful sides of, of engaging the youth. And so it's important for us to, 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 to demand that, can the fourth industrial revolution mean something for black people? Can it mean something for black youth by way of creating jobs and enabling us? Um, we long to speak to those in power because we understand that they can hear us when we speak to them, but they turn their backs and something else happens. And so I think in as far as encouraging a shift in our mindset with technology at our palms, there's, there's platforms like GovChat, there's platforms like Source Tech, uh, 
um, that are really here to make society more engaged, not just with technology, but with how the government can facilitate positives and safe spaces, most importantly. And it's central to what we're trying to, to propose at SOS that we can completely feel safe as if you were in four ways um, in Soweto with exactly the same fee, with exactly the same cell phone and democratizing that technology with, with the kind of effect that it, that it stands to have on gender-based violence is really for us the bedrock with which we believe we can instigate the kind of mentality or at least a desire to adopt a mindset of change and engagement. And so on a parting shot, um, I think it's important to just repeat the most important part that the onus will always be on the government. The South African public has never been unwilling to engage. Um, and the important thing around you know, the government is that we've heard and seen, we'd like them to begin engaging in a way that is action oriented. Um, we've got the best policies and the best constitution in the, in the world. Um, and if we, got, if, if we got a rand for every time we heard that, South Africa may not be in the kind of debt that we need, but the problem is we've not quite seen the government showing up for us. And so I think that would be a fair basis for us to insist um, and repeatedly insist on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tabo. Um, just before I let you go, I have a question here for you. Um, I mean, you, you spent some time looking at the current relationship between the government and the electorate, uh, particularly using the lens of uh, black unemployed youth in the wake of COVID-19. And as you just mentioned now that um, you are proposing that the government can garner youth support by showing up for youth, especially through community safety um, and harnessing Ubuntu in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, but I, I do have another a question for you, Tabo, that um, what future do we, or do you imagine regarding the growing popularity of other forms of expression and their role in the traditional, um, just hold on for me, my screen is lifting up, and, and, and their role in traditional forms of politics and political engagement. So how do we, how can these two coexist towards meaningful engagement? Mm. And I think it calls us to, to insist on a culture that adopts change, or at least that adopts a flexible mindset. And so I think where they converge is really where we, we create spaces um, for more engagement. I think the, the, the great Chinese wall between the public and, and the leadership has crumbled a long time ago. I think that the, the, the cognitive dissonance that we're experiencing is in, is in the policy frameworks that we all agree are awesome on paper, um, but without the ability to enforce accountability. And so, so, so strategically, I believe that we've got the kind of I'd say population for starters is South African, um, just, in, just by way of age group. So, so for instance, insisting on, on tools for communication or insisting on, on a culture that, that allows change and the future that is gonna be changed really has it at its center or at its core, youth and, and, and women and technology. And, and why I choose those, I think as central is because those are the two, so those are the three that have had the, the, the least loud voice um, in the conversation. And so I think, I think centralizing them allows us not to have the answers necessarily immediately, but we can at least point to the questions that allow us to then collaborate to these answers. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Tabo, for a brilliant presentation. I just want to encourage our participant to please, if you have questions, please put them in, in the chat box. But Sisiwe, I want to come back to you here about the question that I asked earlier, considering that um, South Africa is characterized by a dichotomy between classes, the poor and the rich, which then resulted to two economies and two ideologies. So I'm trying to, a question for you is that, um, like I said earlier, that we need to consider mechanisms that are, that are inclusive of all, of all classes and consider these uh, intersectionality of identities and, and considering the two ideologies and two economies that we have. What are some of the, the practical, most tangible mechanisms that we can explore uh, to ensure that there's participation? And there's, there's a question as well uh, that speaks to that, um, that Olandilani Banda um, referred to you, that do we actually have some case studies that points out to the fact that, um, or rather that speaks to how the youth are mobilized by political parties in different uh, social settings. It appears that what matters to rural youth is different to 
to what matters to cosmopolitan youth. Um, so do we have data that, that speaks to, you know, how the different youth um, and, and the demographics respond to, to, to politics? Thank you very much for your question. Um, I think, let me just answer the, the question that came through the chat. Um, yes, we do have case studies um, with regards to, you know, the disparity between youth in more urban developed um, parts of the country and those that are essentially from, you know, rural communities. Uh, but most of that literature um, and most of those case studies are actually done by people of privilege are actually done by people who come from, you know, um, you know, these urban class elite um, environments. And if you assume that a case study is not influenced by someone's class position, by their racial understanding, by even their own politics, then um, you're very flawed as an individual from my perspective. So when looking for case studies around that, I think the best case study that you could possibly have is having actual conversations with people from these different groups, as opposed to just relying on, you know, academic material that comes out of universities. I know as a university graduate, this is not something that people expect me to say, but um, I have found that in conducting my own research outside of the formal institution of institutions of higher learning, I have found more genuine, honest and critical responses coming from young people and, you know, my age mates than I would find in, you know, a textbook that is supposed to perpetuate a particular message. So to answer your first question, are there things that can be done? I mean, at this particular point in time, I think in my presentation, I, I just specifically just highlighted something and I said, we must end the world as we know it, right? Um, and I think that, that, that becomes the solution. So by ending the world, Please, guys, I'm not encouraging people to go and bomb countries and the world and the next thing you have to live on Mars. That's not what I'm saying. Ending the world as we know it means that we need to uproot, right, and decolonize ourselves, especially as Africa, African people on the continent in order for us to re-engineer the kind of society, the kind of political system and the kind of contribution we would like to get and make in society, right? So ending the world doesn't necessarily include violence. It can happen through violence, which is something I'm also gonna speak about because you spoke about police brutality a bit earlier, but ending the world as we know it is a change in epistemological and also foundational um, principles when it comes to democracy. We need to start asking very, very difficult questions, right? Do we need a democracy in South Africa on the African continent? Does democracy as a system of governance work for us? I know it shocks some people sometimes when you're just like, ah, I mean, if we don't have democracy, what are we going to do? That's the thing, right? Um, as Africans, as people to a large extent, we are spoon fed and we are given systems that serve a minority of countries, that serve a minority 1% needs, across the world, but don't necessarily serve the majority of people. So what we now need to start doing is we need to start having honest conversations with ourselves, with our leadership, and also have genuine projections of where we want to be in the future and how we intend on getting there. And the only way we can do it is ending the world as we know it. And what I would like everyone to take cognizance of is the fact that universities are very important universities and schools rather, um, I'll just couple them together. And when I say universities, please also just assume that I'm extending it to colleges, technicons and TVETs as well. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is those spaces, those institutions, those environments are, are microcosms of society. So whatever you see happening in those spaces, you definitely see happening in broader society. The fact that students on campus, let's say for an example, Wits University has 30,626 students. Of the 30,000, only 5,000 students participate in voting for their SRC. The people that will represent them to the management of the university to ensure that you know, things like historical debt, 
things like, um, you know, access to education, um, things like returning to repeat a module or changing courses, you know, are, are swiftly done. The fact that young people don't even participate in their own elections on in their own institutions, be it SRC, be it RCL in high school, that's what that's what we used to call each other, RCL, Lena Representative Council. It's like those little things, the fact that we don't participate in those elections, in those little microcosms of society, alludes to the fact that when we go out into the broader public, we're not going to participate. The same kind of violence we see meted against students, be it because of fees must fall or the Suzo Fundang Intani campaign at universities by police, is the same kind of violence we experience from police outside of the institution of higher learning. Right? So violence becomes something that, pe uh, that permeates all areas and factors of society. It is not only reserved for a particular um, grouping of people, it is not only res uh, reserved for a particular you know, institution, but it transcends race and class in other parts of the world. In South Africa, it's very black. Violence in South Africa is black dominated, black faced, and it is um, you know, geared towards black people. And this is what we see mostly on the continent. And we see that happening in our schools, in primary schools, where learners are killing each other, where students are raping each other. I mean, there's a case at the moment in Limpopo of a 11-year-old who is accused of raping a um, grade um, thingy, grade R learner. So those kinds of things, the gender-based violence that we're experiencing in society, we're experiencing them in institutions and in TVs and schools. And that gives us an idea of why education becomes such a fundamental principle, and such a fundamental concept that we need to be able to draw from and that we need to be able to decolonize in order to create the nation that we want. As much as I'd love to speak much on this, I unfortunately can't, but I would definitely encourage people, um, if Bonolo will allow me, I'd like to submit a paper um, to you know, the Center for Human Rights um, that people can you know, essentially just be able to fully understand and grasp um, the interconnectedness that you know, our society, voter apathy, disillusionment, the fees must fall movement and police brutality and violence have on our young democracy and how this is not going to progress our democracy, but actually create, you know, a austerity measure and create authoritarianism in South Africa that is well within its way of establishing itself. Thank you. Thank you, Busisue. I would like to receive the paper. Um, we have a few minutes left. I'm going to hand over to Supamandla. Um, please answer this question in one minute and then give your concluding remarks. Um, and then and then I'll hand over to Tabo to do the same. Uh, Spamanda, there's a question here that says, what are the factors that lead uh, the electorate to be doubtful on the accuracy of elections and formation of different governments in a democratic way in respect to their countries in Africa in, in general? Uh, so please answer the question in one minute and give your concluding remarks. One okay, thanks, thanks, Bonolo, and thanks to the other speakers for some very insightful presentations. I think for the purposes of answering that question, um, so in under the rest of the continent of Africa, we've seen um, quite significant trends of once we've gotten into a space where there becomes elective elections um, and you have a ruling party, primarily a ruling party that's come about because of um, some sort of a a rebellion against a particular system, um, those dominant political parties then end up um, sort of feeling what it feels like to actually be in power because of the significant passionate networks that are, that are included in that space. So it means that once you have access to government, you also have access to the resources of government and the ways in which the, 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 those resources can be misappropriated to benefit an elite few. Um, and it's that elite few that then has the ability then to shift the, the, the democratic world that necessarily of certain people. So um, you have a takeover of, of primarily of, 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 of the military wing. That means that whichever government that's currently dominant has the ability to then put in place in, uh, systems of lockdown, systems of oppression, which undermine the democratic and legitimate world of certain uh, members of the population, particularly when they're in opposition to the reigning regime. Um, so ultimately, um, the, the, furthermore, the absence of like 
um, monitoring systems um, within the in independent electoral bodies, um, where you have, even when you have um, um, election observers and monitors, their reports necessarily aren't taken into cognizance by the Independent Electoral Commission because the independence of those commissions themselves is questionable because of the ties to the ruling party and, and all of those sorts of things. So those are some of the reasons um, why um, elections become doubtful. Of course, the rhetoric from, from opposition parties and the contesting um, uh, political elite in that space also have an, an implication on the, on, on the sort of the belief that people might have in how free and fair that election process might have been. Um, we've been seeing quite around the world a spread as well of this idea of fake news um, and how ingrained it is in our, in our societies now that we have to have a fact checker for every single thing that politicians do um, is, is quite problematic. So there's a real need to try and, and think about the ways in which we can continue to, to keep, keep um, accurate information at the forefront of people in order to be able to uh, help them to make an informed choice about their, 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 their uh, 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 elective choice and so forth. So to conclude though, um, I think it's important um, to sort of look back around civic education and what it is that we should be doing more in relation to civic education. And I think it's important to highlight a bit earlier around sort of RCL and, and, and at the sort of representative council of learners and, and school governing bodies, for instance. Those are in the first instance that young people have to actually engage with what the political system is. But as we would know uh, from a, from a, a sort of a, a, an anecdotal point of view, um, RCLs themselves are sometimes not, not a necessarily legitimate um, 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 uh, representation of what the young people in that room might feel. There are different reasons why young people might cast a vote, but primarily there's a lot of influence from the authorities in that space. So teachers, for instance, um, when it comes to school governing body elections, it's also quite uh, um, linked to the, to the politics of the, of the ward, the politics of where that school is located, but also the influence of the authorities as well um, in terms of the uh, principal or any other um, individuals in that space. So it's important to think about how do we rejig um, the civic education at, at school level, because we know that life orientation as a subject doesn't necessarily go to the length that it ought to in order to create the necessary civic education. So close off the three sort of things that I've seen that have, that have been permeating in our discussion today. The idea of like where participation seems to be happening. The idea that um, um, what types of participation is considered to be legitimate within the political space. And then lastly for me, the archetype of the young active citizen. And it's inter interesting that um, for instance, um, the people that I've seen more prominently in the party political space, as well as just in civic education spaces, are people that myself and Catherine would be familiar with. Catherine, I know her um, through her involvement at this debating union in the past, and how involvement in student societies that were necessarily not political, but were aimed at creating a capable young person who has the ability to speak, um, for instance, about political issues. Was, was quite an important basis. I think if that were to be available for more people, that would be an interesting sort of uh, a, a place to start around civic education, around empowering young people to have a voice, to articulate on different political issues, even if they might not necessarily be from their uh, dominant geographical um, um, space. So if you're able to express yourself, um, it generally means that you, you have the ability to participate. But what type of expression do we take more seriously in this country is another consideration. As you're talking about one of the, the class certification in the question of participation. Um, when we looked at fees must fall, there was a bit of a disgruntlement even within the movement about when um, participation was thought to be important and worth, worth pursuing policy aims, for instance. Um, we heard the, types, the likes of UKZN, Zululand, um, being somewhat disgruntled about the fact that it only became important when UCT and WIT um, became part of the, of the story. We hear even today when um, colleges are talking about this exclusion conversation about the, the lack of, of, of residences, that this conversation catapults into a space where even at university, looking at the different types of privilege that the institutions themselves carry. Um, so... Uh, Thank you so oh, much. Sorry about that, but you see, uh, my, my apologies. But yeah, at, at least now they know you're a catalyst. Um, yeah, um, nice to see you again, by the way. And thank you very much for the invitation, Bonolo, and to the rest of the participants. We really appreciate this type of engagement. I think it, it will 
definitely um, starts to put us in a, in, in, in a better stead once we start to disaggregate the data that, that relates to voter turnout and what it means for the legitimacy of, the, of those elections. And then, of course, asking political parties whether they're willing to, to govern um, on, with the mandate of, of less than 30% of the country, because that's where we're heading to at this point. Thank you so much, Tamandla. Tabo, literally in, in one minute, here's a question for you. To what extent have the youth been affected by COVID-19? And that might be youth voter at this point. This is in reference to the upcoming um, local government elections in September and November. We're still not sure when those will be held. So to what extent have youth been affected by COVID-19? That might lead to voter apathy. And, and just to, for you to conclude, we, it's now 12.55, so I'm giving you two minutes for you to be done at 12.57. Thank you, Tabo. <laughs> Sorry, B, I'm going to ask you to repeat the last part of your question. My connection has become incredible. To what extent have the youth been affected by COVID-19? Uh, uh, are you here, Tabo? Need my video disengaged. If that's okay. Able okay. To hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay. So I was asking if you could please repeat. My connection has become quite terrible. Um, okay. The question here is: To what extent have the youth been affected by COVID nineteen? That might lead to youth voter apathy in the upcoming. Uh, local government elections. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope I'm better audible. Essentially, what I think that the effect has been that might get us to uh, to be a bit apathetic and find, and find it difficult to participate is that a lot of what's taken place during the pandemic has been re-disenfranchising us. And by that, I mean, we, we as the Black youth, um, suppose if I was in high school, I would have I'll be in a high school that is less prepared uh, to teach me digitally. If I was at university and I'm a missing middle student, I'm less able to learn because I'm in the missing middle. I've either not got a laptop or I can't afford my actual tuition. And what's taken place in COVID with people's income disappearing has really exacerbated that. And so I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be definitive in anything that I described because I believe we're still in the pandemic, but I definitely think that it can get us to be quite despondent as a youth because the important thing is that we've, we've kind of become not okay. we've quite certainly become less economically Okay, Tabo, we, we're struggling to hear you. Um, um, so let's end it there. Um, it's as become a much steep, if you remember my presentation and how I was trying to assistance as the youth, giving us rhetoric on jobs. Um, hello? Yeah, so Tabo, I was saying we're struggling to hear you. It's just unfortunate that your network is bad. So maybe let's, let's leave it at that. Is that okay? Um, so thank you so much, uh, everyone, for, for being part of this conversation. Um, surely it has, it has um, sparked some, some curiosity and interest, and we, we're looking forward to having um, a series of these conversations as we prepare for, for the local government elections. I want to thank everyone that has been here. Um, I know that we went a bit over time, and I appreciate um, that you, you stayed on. Um, thank you to Spamandla Mklongo for always, you know, availing yourself to participate in, in, in our conferences and our webinars. We really appreciate it as the Center for Human Rights. Pusisiwe uh, Catherine, thank you so, so much for, for being here, for your contribution. It's, it's, been, it's been great. And, and also to, to Tabo, um, I know that he's having internet issues, so I'm not sure if he's going to hear this. But also thank you so much to, to Tabo for availing himself to, to come in and, and spend this time with us. And yeah, so thank you. You have yourself a, a wonderful day. Um, and thanks again from us. We, we greatly appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs>